Hi guys, welcome to Learn Today IGCSE. In this video, I will talk about Chapter 6, Space Physics. In this chapter, we will focus on two fundamental concepts. First, Earth and the Solar System. Second, Stars and the Universe. So let's dive in and learn about them. The Earth is a planet that orbits around the Sun once every 365 days. The Earth is tilted on its axis at approximately 23.4 degrees. These two reasons explain why we have four seasons. The Earth completes one 360-degree rotation every 24 hours. Because of this rotation, we experience the phenomena of day and night. Now let's look at the Moon. The Moon is a satellite around the Earth. Know that it takes approximately one month for the Moon to orbit around the Earth. The Moon shines with reflected light from the Sun. It does not produce its own light. Therefore, because of this, we experience the periodic nature of the Moon's cycle of phases. Next, orbital speed. When planets move around the Sun, or a Moon moves around a planet, they orbit in circular motion. This means that in one orbit, a planet travels a distance equal to the circumference of a circle. This is equal to 2 pi r, where r is the radius of a circle. Therefore, we can calculate the average orbital speed of an object by the equation v equals to 2 pi r over t for the solar system. You should know that the solar system is made of the sun, eight planet, make sure you know their name and the order, minor planets like Pluto and asteroids, moon, comets, and natural satellites. Now, the differences in the types of planets are defined by the accretion model for solar system formation. The first four nearest planets are rocky and small, and the four furthest planets are gases and large. Okay, but what is an accretion model? For those who are sitting for IGCSE 2023, accretion model might be something unfamiliar to you, so it can be quite confusing. So I'm just going to break down the accretion model for you. Here is how you outline the accretion model for solar system foundation. Solar system is formed 4.5 billion years ago. A nebula began to contract, collapsing it on itself under the force of its own gravity. The atoms collided together, generating heat. Temperature becomes high enough for nuclear fusion to occur. Now this is how the sun is formed. Material in nebula, not absorbed into the sun, swirls around into flat disk of dust and gas. This disk is called an accretion disk. Accretion disk is held in orbit by the sun's gravity. Moving on to the last part of Earth and the solar system. Gravitational field strength. Objects are attracted towards the center of the Earth due to its gravitational field strength. In simple words, it's the force that attracts you to the core of the planet. Therefore, the bigger the mass of the planet, the stronger the gravitational strength is. And as you move further away from the planet, the gravitational strength gets weaker. A quick reminder. Know that the Sun is actually not at the center of the elliptical orbit, except when the orbit is approximately circular. Okay, back to gravitational strength. Since the Sun contains most of the mass of the solar system, this explains why the planet orbits around the Sun. This force is called the gravitational attraction of the Sun. So, the further the planet is from the Sun, the weaker its gravitational field strength is, and the slower it will orbit around the Sun. Therefore, an object in elliptical orbit travels faster when closer to the Sun. But why? Gravitational potential energy decreases as planet gets closer to the Sun. This leads to the kinetic energy to increase. According to conservation of momentum, kinetic energy equals to 1 over 2 mass times velocity square. So, if the kinetic energy increases, the velocity increases too. Okay, since the sun emits light and is significantly far away from the Earth, 
How long does it take for the light to reach the Earth? Given that speed equals to distance over time, we can simply calculate the time by substituting the distance, which is 1.5 times 10 to the power of 11 meters, and the speed of light being 3 times 10 to the power of 8 meters per second. Please remember these values and the units correctly. Now, you will obtain a value of 500 seconds, which converted to minutes would be 8.3. That's the end for 6.1 Earth and Solar System. Let's dive into the second subtopic of this chapter, Stars and the Universe. The Sun is a medium-sized star consisting of mainly hydrogen and helium. It radiates most of its energy in the infrared, visible, and ultraviolet regions of the electromagnetic spectrum. Stars are powered by nuclear reactions that releases energy, and in stable stars like our Sun, the nuclear reactions involve the fusions of hydrogen into helium. However, our Sun is only one of billion of stars in a galaxy called the Milky Way, with a diameter of 100,000 light years. Astronomical distances can be measured in light years, where one light year is equal to 9.5 times 10 to the power of 15 meters. And other stars that make up the Milky Way are much further away from the Earth than the Sun is from the Earth. Now let's discuss how stars form, live, and die. The life cycle of a star. It all starts with a big cloud of dust and gas that contains hydrogen, which we call a nebula. The force of gravity within a nebula pulls the particles closer together until it forms a hot ball of gas known as protostar. As the particles are pulled closer together, the protostar gets denser, resulting in more frequent collisions between the particles which then causes the temperature to increase. Once the protostar becomes hot enough, nuclear fusion takes takes place within its core. The hydrogen nuclei will fuse to form helium nuclei. Every fusion reaction releases heat and light energy, which keeps the core hot. Once a star initiates fusion, now it is known as a main sequence star, which is a more stable star, like our Sun. While it is a main sequence star, the outward pressure caused by nuclear fusion is perfectly balanced by the inward pressure caused by gravity. Now, this can last up to a billion years and this is the stage where our sun is currently in. At some point though, the star will start to run out of hydrogen, which is the fuel. After this formation, the star is now ready to enter the next phase. But this depends on how big the initial star was. If it was a small to medium star size like our sun, then it would form a red giant. But if it was a really big star, then it would form a red supergiant. Each of these two types complete their star in two different ways. Now, let's look at the red giant first. After several billion years, the red giant will become unstable and eject the outer layer of dust and gas, which we call a planetary nebula. This later leaves a hot, dense, and solid core, which we call a white dwarf. Over time, the white dwarf cools down and starts losing a significant amount of energy until it finally transitions into a black dwarf. Let's now take a look at the red supergiant. Red supergiants, on the other hand, will start to shine brightly again because of nuclear fusion. But after several cycles of expansion and contraction, the core of the star will collapse and cause a gigantic explosion. We call this explosion a supernova. And what happens next, again, depends on how big the star was. If it was just a very big star, it would condense into a neutron star. And in the case of the absolutely massive stars, the neutron star that forms at the center will continue to collapse under the force of gravity until it forms a black hole. A black hole is an extremely dense point in space that not even light can escape from. Okay, that wraps up everything for the life cycle of a star. The last thing we need to look at is the evidence for the universe expanding. Universe has been a single dense point and all of a sudden it exploded and space itself started to expand. So 
What is the evidence for the universe expanding? The first one is redshift of galaxies, and the second one is the cosmic microwave background radiation. Let's look into redshift of galaxies first. But what is redshift? It is the increase in the observed wavelength of electromagnetic radiation emitted from receding stars and galaxies. Increase in visible light wavelength equals to move towards red end of spectrum, whereby the light appears redder. The light emitted from distant galaxies appears red-shifted in comparison with light emitted on Earth. So, the galaxies furthest away are red-shifted the most. This indicates that the galaxies are moving away from us. If the galaxies are moving away from us, it means that it supports the evidence of the universe expanding. Now, let's look at the second evidence. Cosmic microwave background radiation. If we wind back time, it all started with the Big Bang. In that event, there must have been a great deal of energy, high gamma radiation or gamma rays emitted. As the space or universe expanded, these high energy gamma waves, which has short wavelengths, their wavelength will stretch by Doppler effect. So as the universe grew bigger and bigger, the wavelength of the gamma waves would increase to become X-ray. Now, it increases more to UV. The wavelength continues to increase more to visible light and into infrared and finally microwave, which we now observe at all points in space around us. So this cosmic microwave background radiation supports the evidence of the universe expansion. Okay, all this expansion tells us that the universe is moving and traveling at a certain speed away from us. So let's talk about the speed at which these galaxies are moving away from Earth, how the distance of a far galaxy can be determined, and the age of the universe. Now first part, the speed at which these galaxies are moving away from Earth can be found from the change in wavelength of the galaxy's starlight due to redshift. You can see the light spectrums produced from distant galaxies are redshifted more than the nearby galaxies. The greater the distance to the galaxy from Earth, the greater the redshift. This means that further away a galaxy is, faster it is moving away from us. The change in wavelength of the galaxy's starlight due to redshift can be used to find the velocity with which a galaxy or any distant object is moving away from the Earth. Using this equation to compare the ratio of the expected wavelength with the observed wavelength, the velocity can be found. Now, the second part, how the distance of a far galaxy can be determined. By using the brightness of a supernova in that galaxy. Measuring the distance is done using different methods. And the last part, the age of universe. Okay, the Hubble law states that the further away a star is from Earth, the faster it is moving away from us. You can see the relationship of the distance versus the recession velocity here. And the gradient here represents the Hubble constant, which is 2.2 times 10 to the power of negative 18 seconds. Hereby, the gradient of the graph can be used to find the age of the universe. By taking the reciprocal, which is 1 over Hubble constant, the units will become seconds. Therefore, using this, you can estimate the age of the universe, which is about 13.7 billion years, and that all the matter in the universe was present at a single point. So, that wraps up everything that you should know in Chapter 6, Space Physics. I would really appreciate it if you guys could subscribe, like, and comment on this video so you can keep continue watching videos like this. Thank you, have a nice day.